OK, so how many people, just quick show of hands, are already familiar with interactive coding, two-party interactive coding, and how those problems work? OK, so I'll do a quick overview of that and then get into interactive proof systems. So in the interactive coding problem, uh, we have two parties who are trying to compute a function. So this is the same setting as we were looking at earlier today, except now instead of having trying to reduce communication, we're going to try to recover from errors in communication. So we have Alice has her input x, and Bob has his, his input y. And their goal is to compute a function uh, via some protocol, but now we're going to have the situation where Alice is going to send a bit to Bob, and some adversary sitting on the channel in the middle is going to flip this bit unbeknownst to Alice or Bob, and he's going to receive the wrong bit. And uh, so in order to make, um, so I'm not going to assume probabilistic errors, these are going to be completely adversarial for a computationally unbounded adversary. And, the, and this is going to be possible because we're going to bound the adversary's error budget as a fixed fraction of the total communication. So we have some fixed number of rounds of communication. And uh, so we're going to let C be the total communication. And the error bound is going to be some uh, some constant alpha uh, times C. So it can cause like 10% of the bits to be flipped or something. And so uh, many people in this room, uh, Shulman and Anoop, have done some great work on this problem and making it possible to uh, compute the right function despite these errors. Uh, so we're going to be talking about today that was a bit of a different problem where you want to do more than simply ensure correctness. Uh, and so the way that most of these protocols work, if you want to compute uh, the right function is they look at this protocol tree. So you start off with, let's say, Alice sends the first bit, and she can send either 0 or 1, and so on. And everybody knows the protocol tree. And most of the, um, uh, the approaches that we have to interactive coding can sort of be summarized as having a few different steps. So one is that you need a mechanism to detect uh, disagreement. So now that bits are going to be flipped, the two parties are going to diverge in their uh, internal view of what the, what the transcript is so far. So you need a mechanism to, per, to detect that they disagree. You need a mechanism to sort of rewind the protocol or to identify these mistakes, as we were saying earlier, in this case, to like go back to point of agreement. And you need some kind of, uh, and you need some kind of way of measuring progress, so that in moments when the adversary is not spending his error budget, you can be sure that you're making progress down towards simulating the correct transcript. Uh, so, uh, so we have, yes, yes, to what the transcript so far should have been. Um, so they're each simulating what they think the transcript is so far. Their views diverge because of errors, and um, they need a mechanism to detect and to go back and correct and fix and fix these points of disagreement that were introduced uh, by errors. And so, um, so there's various ways of of doing this. So one, uh, so and we're going to care about computational efficiency for the purposes of this talk. So we're mostly going to use. Uh, as lightweight tools as possible. So one very lightweight way of detecting disagreement is simply to use a collision resistant hash. So we're going to use hashing for this. Um, so and mechanisms to go back and mechanisms to measure progress, uh, these are going to be pretty simple. We're just going to move. So we're just going to, um, we're just going to send indices. So we're going to track indices of where of where we currently are and move in small steps. Uh, so the parties are going to move in small steps on the protocol tree. So when they detect a disagreement, they're going to move slowly back to the point where they think they agree. And when they detect that they do agree, they're going to try to move down the tree slowly. And the reason we always move slowly is you might get to a point where there have been errors for a long time. So maybe, uh, so maybe Alice has followed this path down the tree for a long time. And Bob has followed uh, this path 
like this entire other path because there have been a lot of channel errors. You don't want to, even if you suddenly have a clear moment and they send each other their transcripts and they realize that they're way off, you don't want to suddenly jump too much at a time because if that's the part that's wrong instead of if you're actually together and it's now this transmission that's wrong, you're going to cause a lot of damage. So the easiest way to sort of make sure you're making progress in moments of clarity without introducing a new possibility for the adversary to get you off is to move in small steps. So um, yes? Sorry? There is potentially a detection delay. It depends on the mechanism. So today we're going to look at hashing. If you use uh, tree codes in some sense, which was, the, which was the original mechanism, it's a more continuous process. And it, context, it detects it more continually. What we're going to do is we're going to have moments where we just try to simulate a number of steps, and then we're going to hash. And then, so it depends on which mechanisms you choose. Uh, but there is a delay in correction in the sense that if you detect a large gap, you're going to correct it slowly. Because the detection mechanism itself, so nothing is sacred over here. These errors can be anywhere. Uh, well, I'm not, for the purposes of this talk, I'm not going to commit to, there's more than one algorithm over here, and they have different parameters of this. I think the answer is yes, it's, it's a parameter you can tweak. But all of these different choices you make for how you detect disagreement, how you move back, at what speed the players move, affect things like the error rate versus the communication overhead versus all these things, and this is a space of algorithms. Um, so I'm not going to be telling you about a particular algorithm for interactive coding today because I want to talk about a problem where these mechanisms have an, a side effect in terms of information leakage. But in general, yes, this is an algorithmic space that you can explore. Like, do you care about optimizing the error rate? Do you care about optimizing the overhead? There's different, there's different parameters that you can, that you can, um, that you can trade off one another. Uh, so. But sort of my point about this is just that all of these algorithms sort of share this common structure that we're at some rate and in some way detecting disagreement, backing up, going down the tree again. And for correctness, in terms of getting to the correct leaf at the bottom, this seems like a great idea. In terms of information leakage, um, it could, what ends up happening is that uh, the players end up getting extra looks at what the other person would have said in situations that aren't actually on the true path, which is information leakage on the inputs that an error-free protocol would not leak. Uh, so there was an impossibility result proved uh, in 2013 by um, Chung, Pass, and Tulung, which was something was the impossibility of something that they called knowledge preserving coding. And this was a very strong, very ambitious definition. And the goal was, could you preserve not only correctness, but could you preserve correctness and recover from errors in such a way that parties only learn as much information about the input so only learn what could be learned from the error-free execution. Yeah, or uh, yeah, so think of one player as colluding with the channel adversary. So merge the channel adversary into one malicious player. He still has an error budget. And he's trying to learn things about the other person's input that he wouldn't get to learn from an, on it, from an error-free execution of the protocol. Yes. So essentially what you say is, you know, if I'm a malicious, let's say Alice is, is malicious and she wants to learn something about Bob, and the error free, she has an ability to choose one input and run the error free execution. And we want to ask, can that, can the adversary who additionally gets to collude with the channel be simulated by the adversary who just gets to choose one input and run the error free? So both cases, they have the ability to choose the input. 
So the additional leakage that happens. So essentially what they showed is that it's not a coincidence of these other algorithmic choices that any algorithm that uh, for, inter for interactive coding that's going to preserve correctness is going to necessarily reveal the next message function of one of the players in at least one spot, potentially many spots, where it would not be triggered by an error for execution. So they're going to end up leaking more queries to the next message function than the error-free protocol inherently. So regardless of what other algorithmic choices you make. So Yeah, so I think their, their proof technique could generalize to get a tighter bound on the error. They don't state it that way, and I think it's very lossy. I think you could prove something much better than we know on that, on that front in terms of like the number of extra queries that you get. But in some sense, you know, I, I think the more interesting problem becomes if you can't ask for this strong notion, you know, what can, what can you ask for? Uh, you certainly can do quantifying the leakage. Um, and I don't think we have a tight bound. I think we have, um, you know, we have some techniques towards getting better bounds than people have maybe explicitly stated. Uh, but I don't think we know the perfect answer on that front. But I think for a lot of problems, we don't so much care because we're more interested in when can we control the leakage so that we can get something useful than we are in saying um, exactly how much leakage do we have in the worst case. This kind of leakage, you can say that it's a lower bound of uh, the size of the tracks communication because like, if you learn your actual out output plus some more information, then it means that you need at least to communicate this amount of information. Yeah. And I, and I think you could say something like that. I think, you know, coming at this, I think that's an interesting question. I'll, I'll sort of give more of the wishy-washy answer of why cryptographers haven't taken it that direction. In my opinion, I think it's more that, you know, measuring information to us is an unsatisfying measure because I don't really care how many bits have leaked. I care, do they make this cryptographic property unsound or not? So, so what I'm going to show you instead is a very well-defined cryptographic property and how we can preserve it. And there will be information leakage, but we know that the information leakage doesn't, um, doesn't destroy the security property. Yes. Yes. For any algorithm that preserves correctness under a constant rate of error, additional leakage will occur. Yeah, yeah, it's in the middle. It's additionally, it's additionally saying if you think about the other person as a black, bo black box next message function, that you get to ask them more queries than you should. OK. Um, so let me tell you what we can do. And this is in the setting of interactive proofs, where we're not trying to hide everything, but we have a very well-defined security property that we want to preserve. So we're back to two parties, but they're not going to be considered equal anymore. We're going to have a prover and a verifier. And they're not going to be computing a function. We're going to have the prover convincing the verifier of a statement. So the verifier here is going to, we want to run in polynomial time. We're going to ask that the verifier be uh, computationally efficient. And he has no input, but his goal is to verify a statement. So there's some statement x in the language L. And the prover's job is to convince the verifier of this statement, that it, that it belongs to the language L. So x is known to everyone. And the prover may, in some sense, have a witness, w, to the fact that this statement belongs to the language L. Um, it doesn't matter if you think about it explicit or not, because the prover is going to be allowed to be computationally unbounded. So in some sense, he could find the witness himself. Anyway, so we have a computationally unbounded prover trying to convince the verifier that a statement x is in a particular language. And then they do an interactive protocol, so the verifier is going to be probabilistic. So he's going to flip some random coins and ask the prover for some challenges 
So the verifier is going to send, we think about it as challenge and response. And there's any number of rounds here, they go back and forth, and at the end the verifier has to make a decision, am I convinced that the statement is in the language or not? So the statement might be something like uh, that a certain um, circuit formula has a certain number of satisfying assignments. So it might be something like sharp P. Uh, and, um, and the complexity theory uh, result in this domain is that the space of languages, so let me define what it means for a language to have an interactive proof. We need two properties. So we want completeness, which I'm going to define um, the perfect version of completeness, which is going to require that whenever the statement X is truly in the language, that the verifier is convinced with probability one. So if the, if the prover is trying to prove, if the prover follows the protocol and is trying to prove a pr true statement, the verifier is convinced with probability one. We're also going to have a property called soundness, which now the prover is considered to be malicious and is trying to prove a false statement. So for every false statement, not in L, and for every, so I'm going to refer to P star, as the algorithm for a malicious prover, so he's not following the protocol, he's doing whatever he wants, he's computationally unbounded. So for every false statement and for every uh, malicious prover, uh, the verifier, the honest verifier, uh, following the protocol, is only convinced with probability, Let's say you can pick any, your favorite constant here, so we're going to pick probability at most one half. And of course you can amplify this, so um, since we have perfect completeness with probability one, you can simply run the protocol k times in parallel and get a probability of soundness error that's one to the, uh, one over two to the k. So it's not really much of a restriction to pick a half here, you can amplify it out to, to whatever you want from there. Okay, so, um, so any questions about this definition? So the, in the complexity theory question that arises in this domain is what is the class of languages that have a interactive proof system that has this completeness and this, sound pro and this soundness property? And the result is that this class of languages, which is denoted IP for interactive proofs, uh, equals P space. Okay, so you can show every language that can be decided in polynomial space uh, has, has an interactive proof. Okay, and you know here that it is required for the prover to be computationally unbounded. If not, this would collapse to NP. Okay, so the question that, so the question that we asked, um, so this, I should say, this is joint work with Yevgeny Dotis at NYU, and uh, the question that we asked is, is this re does this statement remain true if I can inject channel errors here into the communication uh, between the prover and the verifier? Okay, so now imagine that I'm going to um, run an interactive proof system, but I have an adversarial channel, channel and it has a constant fraction of errors so that's allowed to introduce into the interaction. Um, can I get uh, an interactive proof system for every language that I, that I had in the error-free setting. Uh, so the first, uh, the natural attempt at this might be to take an arbitrary protocol for the interactive proof and compile it with an arbitrary interactive coding scheme. And what you worry about is does this ability to backtrack, does the adversarial channel's ability to sort of rewind the protocol and leak this information, extra information, uh, jeopardize the soundness here because the verifier is sending challenges and responses. And if you can use the guise of channel errors to sort of pick and choose which responses you want to answer and get sort of a sneak peek at the verifier's future challenges before you have to answer them, then you might be able to prove false statements in a way um, that, that you couldn't before. Uh -huh. Why you cannot just use error correcting codes? Yes. So, yes. So the problem with that is the error rate that you can withstand. 
So in the general correctness problem, if you want a rate that's better than one over the total number of messages, then you need to do something different than simply wrap each one in an error correcting code. So let's say that I'm going to have, I'm going to send one bit per round, let's say, and I'm going to have 100 rounds of communication. Then unless I want, I'm willing to take a rate worse than one over 100, there's no error correcting code, I will be able to kill one entire message. And as soon as I kill one entire message, the entire protocol transcript depended on that message, and I will lose correctness. And the same thing happens over here. So this proof that IP equals P space inherently uses protocols with a polynomial but super constant number of rounds. So if I want to withstand a constant percentage of errors, then I'm always going to be able to kill at least one full round. So I'm going to be able to kill many of these rounds, even if they're wrapped in error correcting codes. What kind of error rate you are looking for? A constant fraction. So like 10% of the total bits can arbitrarily be flipped. So that includes an entire message wrapped in an error correcting code. We are going to use error correcting codes in the solution, but they're not in and of themselves sufficient. Just a minute, so yeah. yeah. I mean, I, I care in the sense that I don't want my total communication to blow up unnecessarily. Yeah, but I mean, it will still be a polynomial size. Right? So in, in interactive coding, we're typically at, usually aiming for a constant multiplicative overhead in the total communication. So for this, we, get, we end up with a little bit worse than that, but we do care about that measure. What are you saying? So if, if you don't care about that, no, it's still, it's still, even if you allowed polynomial blow up in communication, if your error rate was still a constant fraction, there's no code that you could wrap each individual message in that would withstand like a 10% error rate. Scale up the error, 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 I think if you make the assumption that the communication is a fixed speaking order, um, you can prove you can't do better. Is it a, it, it's a fourth, right? A new, it's a fourth error bound if you assume that, sorry, there were two questions at once. <laughs> does, does that make sense though? Because like, if the error budget is defined as 10% of the total bits of communication, then when I wrap each thing in an error correcting code of length k, I also multiply the total communication by k, and I give the guy 10 times k more. I, yeah, I, so I everything scales. Control, but we are talking about, let us say, you, you, you just send one bit n times, right? Yeah. Then, uh, uh, then uh, the error rate will be uh, less than one over the number of but it's not a probabilistic error model. It's an adversarial error model. So if I have m, if I have m rounds of communication, then no error correcting code. So error correcting code on its own is less than rate one over m inherently, no matter what rate of code I use. Yeah, it's adversarial. Yes. So the other question was, can I get to one minus epsilon? So in the Braverman Rao paper. They show that if you have a fixed alternating speaking order, you can't get above a quarter, right? Right. But it yeah. But even in this case, it's different. We need to prove stuff. So to prove it's an optimistic order, right? S sorry, is it in, in the IP equals P space setting you're asking if I can? Yeah. Um, yeah, I don't know. I'm not sure. Uh, in that setting, I'm not sure. Errors can be both on the verifier side or the prover side, right? So, it actually turns out, so for the IP equals P space um, setting, you care more about the errors on the prover side because they potentially jeopardize sound. But, um, well, as soon as you can silence one party, then, then you clearly can't do anything. So if the communication is balanced, you can't hope to get above a half because as soon as the verifier's messages don't get through in any sense, then, but whether you can get up to a half as opposed to a quarter, um, even in the regular interactive coding, it depends upon uh, whether you allow adaptive speaking orders or not. So it's, uh, in, this, in this setting, um, 
I, certainly the one half bound is still there because if I can silence either the prover or the verifier completely, then that's a problem. Um, whether between, I'm, I'm not sure what the optimal constant is though. I can, it can't be one minus epsilon because I could silence a party, yeah, yeah. but I don't know what the optimal constant for IP equals P space is. Okay, uh, so, so let me define the security properties that we want in the presence uh, of the adversarial channel for the IP equals P space. What we would like to have is, um, so we would like to maintain perfect completeness sort of despite errors. So what that means is for any adversary causing a total number of errors that is bounded by some fixed constant fraction times the total communication. Uh, and for any statement x that is in the language, the honest prover convinces the honest verifier, which I'll call v, with probability one. So this is the same requirement we had before, but now it has to hold despite a channel adversary introducing a fixed uh, fraction of errors. And then in the soundness setting, we can think of the channel as colluding with the dishonest prover. So essentially, we want to say that, uh, so soundness, so we'll say epsilon soundness, will be defined as for every potential malicious prover who now can use the fact of pretending as if there are channel errors as part of his adversarial strategy. And for every x that's not in the language, the probability of the honest verifier being convinced uh, so is, should be at most epsilon. Okay, so we can define for any given epsilon, this is what epsilon soundness uh, means. Okay, so, um, so we will show that we can get this, say for epsilon one half, with a constant rate of errors being allowed on the channel, so a constant uh, fraction alpha, and with, in this case, a mild but super constant blow up in the total communication compared to the original IP uh, equals P space protocol for the same, for the same epsilon. What, okay, so if I simply take, so, so what happens if I simply take a regular IP um, interactive proof system and I encode it with an interactive coding scheme that has a constant rate of blow up, the trouble is the correctness of interactive coding does not imply the soundness property, right? It does not tell me that a malicious prover cannot convince a ver So in order to prove this, the only way we know how to prove this, and is, which is what I'll show you, is we have to amplify the uh, one half from the original error, we have to make it really tiny so that it can withstand all these additional degrees of freedom that the adversary has in backtracking the protocol. And that introduced, that amplification itself is communication blow up. So if you assume you start from an uh, interactive proof system that has a very negligible, that has an exponentially small soundness error, it can be compiled without additional overhead, but we have to make that additional step. Yeah. And uh, compile with like regular. Uh, yeah. I don't know that that's sound. Ah, so we don't I know suspect that it's, it's, not. it's not. Sound. I think it's not sound, but I don't have an explicit attack. Okay. 
I don't know how to prove it itself. So why, why can we not sound what is the source of difficulty? You say something, but yes. So, so let me give you a little bit of an example of how interactive proofs kind of work. So I'm not going to tell you exactly how they do, but typically you're proving something about a polynomial that you sort of can't afford to brute force check. So the verifier himself, let's say, so something like sharp P complete would be the number of satisfying assignments to a formula. You can change that into a question about a polynomial, but that question, if you brute force checked, would require evaluating at all the points, and it would be inefficient for the, proof, for the verifier to do the computation. So what he does is he asks random challenges saying, what is the polynomial, so there's somewhat of the form, like what is the polynomial on this point? Then what is the polynomial on that point? So if, if you were a malicious prover and you get to say, mm, I don't want to answer that particular question, you know, you see a challenge that you're gonna, is gonna catch you in a lie. So like a malicious prover ends up having to lie, right? And the idea is that in the regular error-free setting, he will be caught in the lie with a certain probability, which means the verifier will ask a particular challenge later on that he will not be able to answer to the verifier's satisfaction. So if you give him this degree of freedom of the guise of channel errors, when he gets a challenge he doesn't like, he can simply say, I didn't hear you, let's, let's rewind. And if the verifier just behaves um, as in the specification of interactive coding schemes that he just repeats himself when he revisits a node, then you sort of get a sneak peek. You can sort of take him down different paths and see which paths have challenges that you like, and then rewind him and send him down the path that is good for you as a lying, cheating. Still, still, still it seems that there's, uh, uh, take a random, imagine if you can reject some random value, but it doesn't <coughs> help you because the next random value is also, also very unlikely to be the good one. So. Maybe you amplify error a bit. But that's exactly what, so that's exactly what we need to argue. How much amplification do we need and how do we control? Because the verifier, the malicious prover, has exponentially many choices in the past he can send verifiers down. So it's very hard to just immediately know that these degrees of freedom do not send you down, do not, um, you know, are not sufficient. Like, how do you know that those degrees of freedom are not sufficient to send you into a bad state? So this is why we need the amplification and we need, uh, we need to carefully track how this soundness error is being amplified by this backtracking capability. It's not an obvious thing. So if I simply compile it, and I, and I think that it requires, so our solution requires that so when you backtrack, you pick fresh randomness which means that at least the, ver the malicious prover doesn't get a sneak peek at your future challenges because when he rewinds you and takes you down again, you're going to pick fresh randomness every time. But you consider the model with public, public bits of verifier or pre private ones? Public. So which is equivalent in the sense that this result of IP equals P space holds whether you restrict the verifier to public coins or not. So, so even this doesn't Still, there is a problem of revealing future yes. challenges. Yes, still there is a problem of revealing future challenges. So there's two potential um, points of leverage that the malicious prover has they didn't have without errors. One is a sneak peek at future randomness along certain paths, and the other is simply that you know he can he can sort of reject challenges that he doesn't he doesn't want to take. So it is the case that we can amplify and we can mute these additional advantages to the point that we can prove soundness. But I, I, there's n I don't see a way to prove it, and I would guess that it's not true if you naively compile the original Shamir with an arbitrary interactive coding scheme. OK, further, further questions about that? OK, so let me define an abstraction in the middle, which is going to capture some of these technicalities which we call backtracking resilient protocol. So essentially, we want to get to the point where we sort of focused in on what the real additional adversarial power is, which is this ability to backtrack. So we can define this intermediary abstraction where instead of having explicit channel errors, we only allow the adversary to insert we call backup steps, where the parties back up. So we have a prover and a verifier, 
and we consider the channel between them now not as flipping bits, but as simply so if we go along and we have rounds that consist of a challenge and then a response and then a challenge and a response, what we're going to allow the channel to do is simply insert a go back symbol that causes both parties to erase the previous round. Okay, so we give the adversary now, or the channel adversary, doesn't get to flip any bits, but he gets a budget of, I'm going to call them backtracks or round erasures. Okay, so the first step is going to be creating an interactive proof system that we can still prove is sound in the presence of an adversary that, that does these backtracking steps. And then we're going to compile that with typical interactive coding techniques into something that we can prove is sound against a bit flipping adversary. Okay, and so the main idea of this is, of course, uh, parallel repetition and amplifying. So. Let's. Well, you can really implement it with any scheme. You can start with a scheme. You can parallel. Um, you can start with any public. Uh, start with any public coin scheme. Uh, parallel repetition to make the soundness error small enough, and then we can simply do a brute force union bound over the adversarial backtracking strategy. So that's what we do. So this, you can start with anything you like. You can start with Shamir. So start with start with any interactive proof uh, protocol. Okay, let's say with soundness error one half. So we'll start out with soundness epsilon equals one half. We will repeat it in parallel. k times, okay, which gets us to a soundness error of, so epsilon now becomes 1 over 2 to the k. Right, so the, uh, the verifier will only be convinced if he's convinced in every parallel copy in which he will choose independent randomness for each one. So if they each have a chance uh, one half of being, of being malicious, then there's only a probability 1 over 2 to the k if you repeat it 2, two, k, two k times that all of them in the uh, malicious prover was able to cheat. So we, get a, so we can make this k uh, whatever we want. So if we're able to, so let's give him a budget of round erasures. We're going to use capital U as a total number of times that the channel can erase a, a round of progress. Then what we can do is, uh, so we can take, so we'll start with an original IP protocol. We'll repeat it in parallel k times. Let r be the number of rounds of the original protocol. And uh, we're going to, we're going to um, compile it so that we can be backtracking resilient. We're going to use, uh, we're going to run for r plus 4. U rounds, okay, so you run exactly the same protocol, that's the parallel repetition, and you just run it for R plus 4 U rounds, and now the claim is that uh, this will have, against the backtracking channel, this will still have soundness epsilon prime, uh, so the soundness error epsilon prime will be at most epsilon times Two to the r plus four u. So if we k, if we take uh, k equals r plus four u uh, plus plus one, then we will get soundness error half on the on the compiled protocol. So all we do is we take something with exponentially small uh, soundness error to start with. We allow the adversary to, to backtrack, and we claim that the cost in the soundness error is bounded by the, and what this is, is this is, an up, is this is a convenient upper bound on the total number of ways that the adversary could choose to distribute his choices to backtrack. So if we think about all of these rounds, in every round he has a binary choice, insert a backtrack or not. So there's 
2 to the r, 2 to the number of rounds, possible choices there. And if we fix such a choice, if we fix a particular adversarial strategy of when to backtrack or not, then that corresponds to a strategy of an original malicious prover who simply does the backtracking in his head. So if we say, OK, what is the success of an adversary who is wedded to this particular sequence of channel choices, then that can be simulated by an adversary in the original case who simply runs the backtracking in his head and does the erased rounds himself. And then what we get is a prover on the original protocol so that we know we can have this bound relationship between the soundness error. Okay. Questions, questions about that? Okay. So the proof is simply the fact that for every fixed sequence of channel choices, you can define an adversary who can be simulated by an adversary on the original protocol without the channel. Somebody runs the backtracks in his head. So his error is at most epsilon. And then there are 2 to the r plus 4 u such choices. And the 4 is going to come from the other piece of the protocol. There's not, it's not motivated at the moment. But you can simply bound all the possible choices that the adversary can make in terms of the channel. For each one of those, you can map it onto an adversary for the original protocol. And so by union bound, you get this very, this very lossy but sufficient uh, bound on the overall soundness error. So the issue with private versus public is that in this case, what I'm going to do is when I backtrack, I'm going to have the verifier choose a fresh challenge at each point. I can't define that in the private coin scenario because his challenges are arbitrary correlated at different rounds. So to make the probabilities clean and independent at every round, I want to use a public coin protocol. So everything I'm saying here is going to be for public coins. So everything here is for public coins. So for a private coin protocol, the verifier's challenge in round i is some arbitrary function of his input and all the previous random coins he has chosen. So if when I repeat, if I go back and I want him to choose a completely fresh random challenge, and I want to analyze those distributions of challenges as independent, I want to use a public coin protocol so that he's not implicitly tied to some arbitrarily correlated distribution of challenges by the previous challenges that he's made. So it just makes things cleaner in the probabilistic analysis. And it's no loss in terms of the, we know it's not a loss in terms of the languages that we can create interactive proofs for. So it's a result, um, uh, it's a result of Goldwasser and Sipser, I believe, that every, interactive proof system with private coins, there also exists one with public coins. Okay, yes, five minutes. Okay, so I'll tell you briefly about the interactive coding techniques that we use to get from this backtracking to the bit flipping. And it's really rather simple um, because mostly we just have to use hashing and error correcting codes. So when you have the bit flipping adversary, and you already have backtracking resilience, then all that happens is that every time the prover wants to send a challenge, so we have this challenge C that he wants to send, and instead we're going to have him choose, um, so he's going to send the challenge along with the hash of the transcript so far. So we have to figure out when we need to backtrack to detect disagreements, so what we do is we hash the simulated transcript so far every time with a fresh key, we send along the key, and we also send along an index of what round we're at. And um, just to make, so, so if we have long messages and we don't protect them with an error correcting code, then we give the adversary a little too much power for introducing one bit flip, because he can disrupt an entire round with one bit. So naturally, we wrap this whole thing in an error correcting code, so that to disrupt a round, he has to pay a constant fraction of that round. And now, though, the only thing that happens is this is going to happen on both sides, that you're going to use hashing and uh, an error correcting codes also in the prover response. And every time they detect an error in the hashes, so every time their hashes don't agree, they back up. 
Okay, and they use the indices of the round to decide so you can get to states where they're in inconsistent rounds. Uh, the same problem happens in regular interactive coding where you have somebody on round 10 and somebody around on round 20. You don't want them to just march back in parallel. They'll always stay 10 rounds apart. So you use these indices to decide who is farther back and the person who's too far ahead marches back to them. So, um, uh, so really what this does is it essentially mutes the effect of bit flipping errors to simply causing these backtracks. Because all you can really do is make them uh, notice that there's something uh, wrong in their hashes and they will go back and fix it. Uh, so, um, so what we get out of this is a constant error rate. And, um, and notice here that Everything here can be made computationally efficient, so hashes can be computed efficiently, error correcting codes can be done efficiently, so the ver state, verifier stays uh, polynomial time. And, um, and the only communication overhead, so the only reason we don't get a constant uh, multiplicative overhead in communication is from this initial uh, parallel repetition step that we need to amplify to deal with all the additional choices that the adversary can make in terms of backtracking patterns. So it's an interesting question whether that's inherent. Um, we don't know. We don't know the answer to that question. I'll leave you with one more open question in this domain that I think is quite interesting, is what happens when you go from proofs to arguments? So in the cryptographic world, we care about also um, uh, what happens against, um, if you relax this completeness, instead of probability one, you want to go to arguments where there's allowed to be some completeness error. And, um, and this parallel repetition doesn't work for arguments. So it's known that there, are some that there are some barriers to making parallel repetition kind of techniques work for arguments. And because of that, we can't amplify things simply and well enough to make it obvious how to do interactive coding for interactive arguments. So, um, so it's an open question how, how to do that problem against an, an adversarial channel. Okay. <laughs>